Nigel. Say hello. Hello. Nigel. Okay. Hey, hi, hello. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess. And I don't think you can see Nigel, but he is right here. We went on a walk before we started filming, so he's a little tired. But welcome to another installment of Book Community, where I try to keep you abreast of the goings on in the bookish community. So first I wanted to start with an update from last week's video. So I talked about the issues people had with um, the stunt double for Amita Suman from Shadow and Bone, the Netflix adaptation. The actress who plays Inej because she had a white stunt double who was, you know, painted brown, brown face to match her in the show. And so people were expressing their disappointment or outrage with that. And then Lee Bardugo went live on, um, on Instagram and addressed it as much as she could. I'll insert part of it here. It was like seven, minute, seven minutes long, so I don't want to put the whole thing in. I'm going to wait a little bit just to see if um, some more people are going to join. I know um, probably a lot of you don't even know uh, what the stunt double situation is, but I'm going to be as clear as I can. Um, although <laughs> I... Mm, I need to make it clear I'm not speaking in any official capacity, okay? Um, so I, I really hope to be able to come to you guys with more information uh, at this point. Um, and, uh, and I didn't, but I didn't want to wait any longer to talk about this because I want you to know you're being heard and that we're taking what you say seriously. Um, I became aware of the stunt double situation explicitly um, that white stunt doubles were being used for actors of color last week. Um, and we had to have some pretty big conversations before I could speak on this. And again, I need to make clear I am not speaking in any official capacity, but I need you to know that we take this seriously. And I know that some of my readers are hurting and some of our audience is hurting, and I hate that. Um, okay, so when I saw those photos, uh, I was angry and I was shocked. Um, and mostly I was deeply ashamed that this had happened on the Shadow and Bone set and that the show had failed, we had failed to protect our actors. No one should ever be put in that position and these are such wonderful people. They did not deserve this. And you deserve better too. Okay, we failed you too. Um, I'm just deeply sorry that it happened. But what I really want to say is that um, the important thing is what we're going to do next. So um, we are committed to making sure this never happens on one of our sets again. Eric and I have talked a lot about this. Um, we would love to be part of a broader policy that keeps this from ever happening to anybody again. Um, but again, there are sort of big conversations going and I just want you to know that this isn't something I am ignoring or brushing under the rug. Um, I take it very seriously. And, and I understand if you feel that you can't, um, if you feel that you can't, uh, and I, I want to say also what the photos were. I, I want to be real clear about this. I had never heard of painting down before, but let's call it what it is. It's brown face. Um, and I want you to know that, that, that it's unacceptable to, to me and to the other people involved in this show. And, um, when I talk about conversations and I talk about commitment, it's not just about finding somebody to blame or finding one scapegoat because this is a bigger problem than one person making a bad decision. This is a lot of bad decisions. And so it really has to be about a commitment to doing better and providing safety and respect and opportunity um, moving forward. So um, I hope I hope that you'll stick with us. I hope you'll give us the chance to earn back your trust. but. I also understand if you feel that you can't, um, I get that. If you can't support the show, if you can't support me, I absolutely get it. 
Um, but if you will stick with us, I, Eric and I will do everything we can to make sure this doesn't happen again. And um, yeah, and that's really all I wanted to say. I am sorry to be so vague. So I thought that was, she didn't have to do that and she obviously wasn't speaking in an official capacity and they probably wanted her to wait. Um, before they made a statement, but I appreciate her doing that. And obviously one of the posts I shared last week made a point to say, please don't go after the stunt double, the the actors or Lee Bardugo because you know they didn't have anything in the casting, but it was nice that she acknowledged that, that she heard what fans of the show were saying and wanted to address it. So thank you, Lee, although, we have our beef with King of Scars and Ninth House. I still appreciate you, girl. So it's all love. I'm like looking at this stack of books that's right there. <laughs> and they're like teetering on the top of a mass market paperback. And I just, mm, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to test that right now. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to let it be. <clears throat> okay, also, I was gonna make a separate video on this and then I just did not feel like giving this person my time and I don't think it would have had that much of an effect anyway, so I'll just do it here. But um, the author of The Woman in the Window, so his pen name is AJ Finn, his real name is Dan Mallory and he is literally a scammer. He is the definition of a mediocre white man that constantly is rewarded and he his book woman in the window was adapted to a movie that came out on netflix this past friday i believe what i didn't know was it originally was scheduled to be like a big box office production that was supposed to come out i think in 2019 like in theaters and for various reasons there's a whole article i won't spend a bunch of time on it here but i'll link it if you want to read it on why that didn't happen because i think it was bought like by fox and then disney bought fox and then things with him and Dizzy was like, mm, and all these issues and it ended up being sold to Netflix. So it kind of got bumped down. Even though Netflix movies are really good, the article goes like, it was kind of like, you know, straight to TV movie or straight to DVD. So that made me happy that it kind of got downgraded. I mean, still probably with Netflix, he's still probably getting a good amount of money. Whatever it has good actor actors and actresses in it, sadly, but but a TLDR of Dan Mallory. He literally is a scammer his entire life. He's made up stories to get ahead, and people have believed him because it's what happens with mediocre white men. They're rewarded. They're never questioned for credentials or or backstories. And so there's a long article in the New York Times that was they, I think came out two years ago, and it talks about how he lied about family members having um like cancer, ha lied about himself having cancer, like a brain tumor, just all these things. He was an editor for, was it William Morrow? Like he did go to grad school for something, but I don't think he finished, but he would still say that he had his masters. Just all these multiple things that he would lie about or embellish or just completely make up in order to, to get pity, to get somebody to give him a job. It's a long article. There's so much fucked up shit he did. Like he, there's a part where he like left cups of pee in his boss's office. I don't know. He just makes up these stories and people would believe him and felt pity on him. The person who was doing the article interviewed like people from his past who were like at, I think it was Cambridge or I don't know if it was Cambridge or Oxford. And they would tell him, the person writing the article like stories and like yeah and during this time his mom was going through cancer and his mom died yeah he like lied about his parents dying and the person interviewing them was like his parents are very much alive and they're like so he lied to me like these people really believed him like he was that convincing said he had a brain tumor and like cancer and some of these things i think at some point maybe his mother did have cancer or, like maybe he did have a health concern but he basically lied about all these things to different people in careers and at schools and it has always worked for him to get ahead but then after a while things were coming out people were talking about him when he wrote his book and it was being sold or pitched at auctions and a lot of publishers didn't want it because they heard the history behind him but his own publisher that he was working for as an editor bought it and obviously a lot of people have read it it's a very popular book and then it got its adaptation so anyway the article is super long it goes into all the fucked up shit he did but it just pisses me off that he continues to be rewarded for his lies and 
honestly be below mediocrity, but that's what happens. Please read mediocre. And if that's not bad enough, they're going to reward him again and they're going to make the story of his life and his actual like scams and all the fucked up shit he's done into a TV show starring Jake Gyllenhaal. I was, my friend told me about it and she was like, maybe it's to make people aware. No, fuck awareness. That New York Times article already came out. We can tweet about it. You can, you know, make a, a big campaign if you want to give awareness. You don't give somebody who's been fucked up and lying about your parents dying to get ahead a fucking TV show starring Jake Gyllenhaal because you know he's making money off of it. They're not going to be able to tell his life story and not pay him money. This article says... <clears throat> At some point, potentially after many, many delays, a movie based on Dan Mallory's thriller novel, The Woman in the Window, which he wrote under the pseudonym A.J. Finn, might come out. But congrats in a way to Dan Mallory slash A.J. Finn, who has done enough heinous things to also inspire a show based on his life and the many lies surrounding it. Per deadline, Jake Gyllenhaal is attached to a star in a TV show based on the New Yorker's article about Mallory's many deceptions, which included lying about his mother and brother's deaths, having surgery for a brain tumor, and according to some former co-workers, leaving plastic cups full of urine near an enemy's office. This Mallory has denied. So the director of Lemon and Zola is on board to write and direct the potentially urine involved series, co-writing the pilot with Brian Salveson. Our protagonist is white, male, and pathological, she told Deadline. There is a void in him and he fills it by duping people. He's a scammer. This series, it, this series examines white identity and how we as an audience participated in making room for his behavior. Presumably that means also considering how having Jake Gyllenhaal play you on TV factors into the very questions of participation and Award. She says this series examines white identity and how we as an audience participate in making room for his behavior. This is literally how you continue to make room for this bullshit ass behavior by rewarding him with a TV show. I'm sorry. It enrages me to no end. If you read the book and you liked it, that's fine. But I'm just pissed that he continues to succeed regardless of people knowing that he has fucking lied and scammed his way to where he is. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is literally mediocre in a living example sorry i'm just like i'm infuriated of course there doesn't say anything of like what he would make from this movie but i'm like 98 percent sure that dan mallory will be paid from this movie based on his trifling ass life and i'm mad about it so anyway there's that if you enjoyed the movie great i don't care i'm not gonna watch it i fucking hate it i like jake gyllenhaal but i'm not gonna watch this shit either because i will not in my mind continue to make room for white mediocrity because i see enough of it on the daily in my regular life no thank you <sighs> okay let me calm down All right, so it's May 2021 and you know, we go through trends and right now the current trend is biphobia. So there was your warning. I hope you sense the sarcasm. But so multiple things. I think I talked about this in multiple videos recently. There's just been a lot of biphobia. I do not understand. I just don't get why people are so angry or oppressed at people who are bisexual like what does that bother you it doesn't take anything away from you or your sexuality i'm really not understanding it but it's going on it's a thing and i saw yesterday or was tagged yesterday in a book and a question on goodreads so the book is called perfect on paper okay why did i go on to goodreads i was like i hadn't heard about this book lies i had it on my want to read and i'm like oh i don't remember putting it there but now i definitely am gonna have to read it and it's by sophie gonzalez so on goodreads it says in perfect on paper leah on the offbeat meets to all the boys i've loved before a bisexual girl who gives anonymous love advice to her classmates is hired by the hot guy to help him get his ex back so I won't go into that whole thing, you know, that it's got a cute little cover, right, right. So someone asked a question on Goodreads and they said, hey, does anyone know why this book is labeled as LGBT when the main relationship looks like a straight one? And the author replied, the main character is bisexual as is stated in the summary. She has feelings for her best friend, it ends up with a guy. The story explores how biphobia and bi erasure impact a bisexual person if they end up in a different gender relationship. It is not a straight relationship because the people within the relationship are not both straight. It's a male female relationship. The main character is LGBT and it covers multiple LGBT topics. It can't get much more LGBT than that. Smiley face. 
And so the author tweeted, you know, tweeted that and said, I said what I said. Someone quote tweeted that and said, my book has a ton of graphic gay sex, check and mate. I really don't understand why your book can't be seen as queer if there's no sex in it. And that just, Gretchen. And so people were responding like, why are you an adult concerned with teenagers in a book having enough sex? One, okay, and two, perpetuating the idea that queer lit has to have graphic gay sex to be considered queer. I, but there were a lot of replies on both sides. Like this person, LGBT is such a useless descriptor in this context. Honestly, sure, having a straight or male, female, whatever relationship at the center of a novel doesn't mean it has nothing whatsoever to say about queerness, but I'm not sure it has anything to say about the GLT experience, LMAO. I definitely believe you can't get more bisexual woman in a relationship with a straight cis dude feeling insecure about it than this book though. Like when a book is queer, and people just use or like a tag it as LB LGBTQ does not mean that it represents every letter in that abbreviation. It just means it has some queer aspect in it. And in this case, the B for bisexual. So someone asked Gretchen, what does this mean? I'm confused. And Gretchen said, it means my book depicts queer as a verb rather than a noun. So there were people going back and forth some people defending the book and some people being biphobic as fuck. It's like, make it make sense, but it doesn't make sense. Gretchen and all of those who agree with Gretch need to go sit down and you really need to take a look in the mirror and, and ask yourself some questions because it's weird as fuck. Of course, I got on Twitter later and saw another tweet from Gretchen that says, why Twitter is truly horrific. A bunch of repressed late 20 somethings writing sexless high school drama and saying it's queer because the heroine and her best friend hold hands before splitting up to marry their respective boyfriends. And there were some people who agreed with Gretchen in the replies, but a lot of people were responding to Gretchen and like someone said, have you met queer teens? Like 90% of us are unable to have sex with the same gender solely because enough people aren't out. Also like you, an adult pushing teenagers, especially queer teenagers to lose their virginity is really not it. And Gretchen said, please calm the fuck down. It's just like, I don't understand why Gretchen is so pressed about people having sex. Someone made a great, um, comment where they said that this is really like ace phobic as well because there are people who are not uh don't like sex or aren't sexually attracted to people so it's really um ignorant to assume that every teenager is horny and thinking about sex because they are not um did i think that when i was a teen yes because was i one of those teens yes but every teen every adult isn't like that um and this is the last tweet that I'll say about this situation. If a book is about queer characters, it's queer. That's really all there is to it. Doesn't matter if they're having sex, slaying dragons, or just being big balls of anxiety, all queer experiences are valid. Bloop, blip, blop, kick rocks, Gretchen. I just, I really don't know what's in the air, what's in the water, but it really is like, ooh, buy a racer, let's do it. And I'm over it. Tell the people, hi, you're sleeping so they can't see you. Say hello. Are you going back to sleep? Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, just wanted to throw this in here as proof that cancel culture doesn't work or to show you that how small our book community is, that it doesn't affect the larger publishing world because recently I saw on Twitter, the bookseller, the UK's definitive book industry magazine and website, said that so the crime fiction book of the year award was awarded to Joanne Rowling for Troubled Blood so there's that not gonna spend any more time on it but just know that <laughs> We can only do so much here in this community, not to say we shouldn't do things or speak out about things, but it doesn't really exist. They keep on thriving out there regardless. <sighs>
Quickly, I just wanted to share this because Simon & Schuster is having a contest. It says, Simon & Schuster's Books Like Us, first novel contest, a new annual opportunity to highlight underrepresented writers and celebrate the diversity of the readers we serve. Anyway, this is our mission. Gallery Books and imprint of Simon & Schuster is pleased to announce the launch of the Books Like Us first novel contest to facilitate accessibility to underrepresented writers and celebrate the diversity of readers across the United States. As the nation strives for progress, Gallery Books and Simon & Schuster aim to help catalyze the change by amplifying voices that represent us by publishing books like us. In future seasons, the Books Like Us first novel contest will rotate among other Simon & Schuster adult imprints. A two-week entry period will begin Tuesday, June 1st. At that time, writers are invited and encouraged to submit 25 pages of an original adult novel using the online form below. The publisher welcomes inclusive, entertaining, and, and groundbreaking reads with expert pacing, depth, as well as heart and irresistible characters who leap from the page. At the end of the submission period, the editorial, marketing, and publicity team at Gallery Books will review all submissions for originality, relevance to today's publishing climate, and writing quality. In December 2021, the author of the selected novel will be awarded the opportunity to enter into a $50,000 book deal with Gallery Books. So the period is June 1st to June 14th, 2021. Um, and then they have the dates for semifinalist, finalist, grand prize. And then they have all of their FAQs. And one of the ones that this tweet brought to light was, will the winner be paired with a literary agent? And they said the winner will be provided a list of literary agents they could choose from who we will pitch for representation. So this tweet said, Okay, y'all, we're gonna talk about why it is a terrible idea for a publisher to be like, if you win our contest, we'll provide a list of agents for you to query and why choosing your agent is incredibly important. And then they said they're mentioning this from the contest. So first of all, you need the freedom to choose any agent to query. The publisher can definitely recommend people, this does happen, on agent and author situations, but A, you shouldn't feel obligated to keep to only those agents, and B, you should be pitching, not the publisher. Your agent is your first line of defense against publishing bullshit you don't want one who feels obligated to the publisher before you and if the publisher is controlling your relationship with agents this is what taking over pitching is that's not in your favor it's not in your favor because you need to hone your pitching skills you will use them for the rest of your career this control grab of the contest project tells me this contest as it stands is not about building a career this is about one book and here's the thing publishing is about the book of the moment the project they have on their hand they paid for that's their job but the agent's job is the author's whole career, which is why having the freedom to choose and pitch yourself equals important. There is nothing wrong with an editor or contest runner being like, hey winner, here's a list of agents we love that you can add to your pitching list, but to try to control the querying and pitching process like this makes me make this face. <laughs> and it's this gift. I'll also mention this setup could heighten the thing newer authors feel, which is fear of their publishing gatekeepers. I don't think it's on purpose because most of them don't think of the fear, but these elements could create a bad situation of fear and distress. Not to mention it's taking skills you need to develop for career longevity away from you by trying to control the pitching process. You need those pitching skills. Simon & Schuster should rethink this. The writer deserves freedom of choice and pitching. So if you saw that contest, which is a great thing, step, you know, just think about that if you're entering but I mean I like the idea so we'll see where that goes and I just wanted to share that in case anyone was thinking about entering that contest hey are you tired did that walk tire you out you don't have to tell the people nothing this week. No. Okay. So lastly, we shall talk about an email that an author received and some discourse around that. So Caitlin Barron lies. Lay down. Lay down, boo. What are you smelling? There's nothing on my shelf. Thank you. What do you smell? That's my sunscreen. Don't lick that off. That's not nice. Okay, can I can I tell the people? Can I finish my story? Thank you, Boo Boo. Kaylin Barron, the author of Cinderella is Dead, which came out last year, I believe. It's a young adult. I haven't read it. I think it's a fantasy. Yes. <laughs> I think it's like a retelling, a reimagining of Cinderella, but like years in the future. Anywho. Cinderella's Dead, beautiful cover, 
popular book last year. So she received an email. The tweet she shared said, morning, I don't normally pay these things too much attention. I'm good at brushing off weird emails, but this one struck a nerve. I have thoughts. It's not about this person as an individual. It's about the rampant misogyny noir in the book community. It's exhausting. So the email she received said, I love Cinderella is dead. Please don't take this the wrong way because I'm only trying to help. But I've been reading YA for 10 years and I wanted to reach out to tell you that I believe in this book so much, but it could be doing better if you made it more relatable. Something you should know about YA is that people like new things, LGBT, yay, but they need to do it in a way that doesn't make people feel bad. You have two black girls as the main characters, and I think that's so good for people to see, but it's new and they're not used to it. If you make one of them white, more people will want to read it and you will do so much better. I promise. Look at the other books in YA. The ones that have black characters also have white love interests. That really, really makes people feel like it's real and they can relate. I want you to have that kind of success that other books have because you are a great writer. I hope you'll take my advice and I hope your next book will be a big hit. So a few things. Obviously, why would you send this email to somebody and tell them, hey, your books could do so much better if you added white people, then it's really relatable. So then there were conversations about how, you know, marginalized groups, especially black and brown people have had to read white stories for years and we could relate to those. I loved uh, Beverly Cleary's Ramona books and I saw myself in Ramona. It was easy. We had similar personalities. You don't have to look like somebody to relate to them. So there was a lot of conversations on relatability and you know how we've had to do that for years for white books and now that the books are having more black main characters, suddenly it's not relatable. But then also, so Erin from Booked and Busy, I don't know if you subscribed to her channel, but she made a video talking about this, um, kind of the conversation as a whole and the popularity of interracial romances because while Kaylin didn't deserve to get that email, and correct me if I'm wrong because I haven't read the book, her own book has the main character eventually getting into a relationship with, with a white girl. So. The black main character is dating a white girl, so an interracial romance. So the person who wrote the email, I think Aaron was like, did they not read the book? Because there is an interracial romance in there. Um, and I think another big author, maybe, was it Leah Johnson, who had another, who also had a book that came out last year that I think was also sapphic, but it was an interracial romance. And so Aaron's video was just talking about this and how those are the popular stories and how there isn't as much black love or, you know, a brown, not enough brown people in love. There's usually always a black or brown person and a white person in these relationships, in the popular stories. Um, like the Brown Sisters series, all three of those sisters don't end up with um, another black man, even though they're all black women. Then obviously these young adult books, um, I'll have Erin's video linked down below. And she also mentioned talking, especially like in sapphic stories, how it's usually always interracial. So there's multiple conversations going on in here. One, why would you email an author that? But then again, humans are just very bold on the internet. Two, a book shouldn't have to have white characters in it for it to be relatable. Like it's, you can relate to the person's struggles or personalities, things going on in the story, not because they look like you. Like those, um, that shouldn't be the only thing you need in a book for it to be relatable. But then it is weird that she got this email and then that she made this statement since she does have a white love interest in her story. Not to say that's not good, obviously. I'm married to a white. <laughs> I read interracial romances, also black romances, but it um, just adds to the conversation. Something, you know, obviously like Ashley, a bookish rum has been talking about for a long time. Is publishers don't invest in black romances. They don't look at, okay, the book I'm gonna, t look, for instance, Sweet Hand, okay, my current favorite book, Black Romance, not a lot of people have read it or are talking about it. It got published by a smaller imprint under Hashtag UK, but did not get a lot of push. And I'm assuming because it's a black romance. And I love Talia Hibbert. I love the Brown Sisters books, but those have been very much um, hyped up and a lot of publicity pushed for those. 
and they've done very well. Some tweets about this conversation I saw were, y'all can't relate to black people loving one another. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, 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 all right. Okay, where are you going? All right, okay, all right. <laughs> So y'all can't relate to black people loving one another because y'all can't relate to black happiness that doesn't cater or serve whiteness. Sad. Y'all are sad. Pitiful. It's so crazy to me to see how white people expect every other race and minority group to relate to their stories. But when it comes to movies, TV shows and books centered around people of color, they can't do the same unless they're somehow centered around them. <clears throat> black readers have spent our entire lives consuming stories written by white authors. We diversify how we relate to characters that don't look like us. We adapt, we make do. And yet some white folks are so used to books that cater to the white gaze, they can't handle books that don't. Pub wants to acquire black stories, but they don't know how to market slash cater to black audiences. Our stories are judged on a scale of how relatable they'll be to white audiences. This has led white readers to demand black authors to write to their wants because pubs spoiled them. So I think this also like encourages more people, especially romance authors to write interracial romance because they know that'll be more accepted or uh, more likely to be published and to do well because it's more relatable. And then this tweet I saw was, a lot of people have been saying for a lot of years that the way publishers use interracial romance books with a white love interest as diversity light is a problem. I hope a bunch of people see that now. Diversity light is a great, <laughs> great term. Because side note, you also can have interracial romances and then not be with a white person. Like there's other, there's other groups out there, but you know, whatever. But this was quote tweeted and they said, it's the outrage at that email, but the fa failure to make this connection for me. And then a reply, yep, some people who are tweeting responses are also part of the problem, but they ain't ready for that combo yet. Listen, this is the primary reason why changing things from the inside doesn't work for me. If they do eventually switch up from only writing black woman, white man, interracial romance, they see a noticeable dip in sales slash interest. And that improves what for black romance authors coming up behind them. Publishing just says, see, we took a chance on this black romance and your sales declined. Black romance doesn't sell, but of course your sales declined because you trained your audiences to read black woman, white male, interracial romances. And then exactly when people make the argument that black romance doesn't sell, I ask when they tried to make it sell. The same marketing and placement overall isn't there with the exception of a couple titles. So it's already probably harder for people to get their books picked up by a traditional publisher if they do not write interracial romances. And then if they are, they are not putting the same amount of effort, time, money into marketing the book. So then it doesn't reach as wide an audience. So then they can say, oh, well, we tried. We did that once, see, it didn't do that great. And so I was talking with someone and actually it was Miss WOC Reader. I was talking with her and I was like, do you think that authors want to write like black romance and if they get picked up by a traditional publisher, their agent or editor or whoever is like, ah, can you change it? Or if people are just already writing interracial romance. And so she was kind of saying, I think it's um, more like people are seeing that interracial romance does well. So, does well. so like people are writing inter interracial romances because they know that's going to be picked up. That's going to be traditionally published because there's just not a lot of traditionally published black romances. A very, black romance is very much in the indie um, category. And yeah, so very interesting conversation. So that's it for this week. We can go take a nap downstairs. Oh, she so could get comfortable. Oh my goodness, you're so tired. You wanna go take a nap downstairs? We can snuggle. Oh yes, we can snuggle, boo boo. Oh, thank you, bubbas. So let me know any thoughts, comments about these things that have happened this week. Check out my description. I always have links to information uh, that I included in this video, any articles or anything that I can link. I also, <laughs> Also have links to my social media, um, links to information about events that are going on around the world so you can educate yourself and um, if you want to donate or help out any cause and ways to support my channel. But me and this sleepy one are out for today. So please stay, <clears throat> please stay, <laughs> stay blessed, hydrated, moisturized and sunscreened and I'll see you in my next one. <laughs> Bye. Is this thing on? Are you still here? Nigel, the people have requested a song. What shall I sing to you today, my love? <clears throat> Is 
I don't know how many of y'all gonna know this song, little oldie, little throwback. Boo boo, I'm gonna sing to you. Out of all the dogs, you're not like the others. From the very first day, I knew we'd be lovers. In my wildest dreams, my darkest desire. What I declare to you, your love takes me higher. Just when we both thought our lives were set in stone, they shone a light and brought us together. We are two in a million. We've got all the luck we could be given if the world should stop. We'll still have each other and no matter what We'll be forever as one Did you like it? Do you like my song? We're two in a million! Do you agree? I love you. Get on my kitchen. Oh, thank you boo-boos.